An ex-president stripped of the flourishes of exaggerated fame and status was today reduced to the role of basically a spectator as his lawyers and prosecutors picked out the 12 people who will ultimately determine his legal fate. Inside the courtroom, we saw once again what looked like a diminished Donald Trump subject to the rules of this judge in this courtroom. Just outside the courthouse, it was a different story. Trump lashed out. This morning, he called the trial itself a disgrace and argued that all he was indicted for was, quote, paying a lawyer and said it was just a, quote, legal expense. It's a story that collapsed on live TV like a house of cards years ago, thanks to Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Watch. Having something to do with paying some Stormy Daniels woman 130000 I mean, which is going to turn out to be perfectly legal. That money was not campaign money. Sorry, I'm giving you a fact now that you don't know. It's not campaign money. No campaign finance violation. So, so they, they funneled it through the law firm. Funneled through the law firm, and the president repaid it. Oh, I didn't know he did. Yeah. Funneling. Usually not a word associated with legal financial schemes. In this case, a hush money payment, according to Rudy Giuliani, funneled through his lawyer with the intent to influence the 2016 election. So back in 2018, when these facts were examined, a federal judge ruled this about the facts, quote, Cohen committed two campaign finance crimes on the eve of the 2016 presidential election with the intent to influence the outcome of that election. He, Michael Cohen, made or facilitated payments to silence two women who threatened to go public with details of purported extramarital affairs. And Mr. Cohen admitted that he did so in coordination with and... Here's the important part, at the direction of individual one. Those payments were all part of a bigger scheme hatched by individual one, Donald Trump, and Michael Cohen. New York Times reports this today, quote, in a development that will bolster their case, prosecutors on Monday secured permission from the judge to admit evidence connected to Trump's overall political strategy in 2016. Much of it bears the former president's imprint. Aggressive tweets, false denials, coordination with a tabloid publisher, and more. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office obtained permission from the judge Monday to introduce evidence related to a 2015 meeting among Trump, Mr. Pecker, and Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen. A prosecutor, Joshua Steinglass, said on Monday that the three men had, quote, conspired to influence the 2016 election. Here's how it was explained by New York Times reporter Jim Rutenberg in the documentary series, The Fourth Estate. It's the summer of the campaign. And just another day at the office, a Playboy model has emerged. She's going to allege an affair with the president mm -hmm. um, several months after the birth of his child with his current life, wife, Melania. OK, that's a day at the office. So what are you going to do? Cohen developed his own relationship with the Inquirer on behalf of Trump years ago. So the Inquirer proceeds to do what's called a catch and kill, where they buy her story and in a deal for $150,000, she will not talk about the affair during the campaign. And all of this, it seems, is part of what it means to be Donald Trump's fixer. A scheme to interfere with the 2016 election, now the foundation of the first ever criminal trial of an American ex-president is where we begin again today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. With me at the table, New York Times investigative reporter Sue Craig is back. Tristan Snell is also here. He's a former assistant attorney general for New York State, where he led the investigation and prosecution of Trump University. He's also the author of Taking Down Trump, 12 Rules for Prosecuting Donald Trump by someone who did it successfully. We'll delve into that. Also joining us, former RNC chairman, co-host of MSNBC's The Weeknd, who had the only live interview with Michael Cohen this weekend. Michael Steele's here. And the national correspondent for the New York Times, Jeremy Peters, is here. Very familiar with all of that reporting um, that we've been discussing. Sue Craig, I want to start where I always start with you and that tantalizing page full of <laughs> notes. <laughs> well, I was going to tell you, I almost called you to say I can't, I can't come, come up because the end of the day was... Wow. I mean, it was fascinating. And they actually ended up, the last I looked at my phone, they have six jurors. But the morning started out pretty much like most jury selections that I've seen. They went through and the jurors that didn't leave, that remember half of them yesterday just said mm -hmm. they couldn't be fair. and they 50, were, right? 50 just walked out. 
And so, and they weren't asked any questions, and it could have been they had obligations or they couldn't be fair. So we were left with, you know, about 50, and notably several, a handful, five or six maybe, you know, around that number, came in today and said overnight they realized they couldn't be fair. And some of them actually took us through the whole questionnaire before they got to that point, so mm. that wasted some time. But everybody who was went through the questionnaire, we got kind of a sense of who these people are on a really surface level. We have a lot of New York Times readers, a lot mm. of dog owners. Mm. Um, they, they're an interesting group of people. There were some lawyers, but, you know, they, they didn't, when you got to the questions of could they be fair, all of them sort of said they could. They could set aside their biases. Mm. They're not asked if they're Democrats, but you could sort of tell. So this went through kind of the, the morning section. And then we went on a lunch break. We had some people that survived all that. And, and then during the lunch break, um, the lawyers, particularly sort of what's notable for this conversation is Trump's team went and they have the names of the jurors and they scrubbed them over the lunch hour. And as soon as we got back, hmm. Todd Blanche, who is the lawyer for Trump, he came in and it was fairly explosive. And he said that he had found you know, very... I, exact words, but pretty incriminating evidence against several of them. So that started a whole thing. And the first one What does one that was, mean? I mean, they're not on trial. Well, that was, so the judge actually reminded them of that. But they, they had things on their social media posts that, that, that Donald Trump and his lawyers found troubling. Mm -hmm. So the first one... In the category of bias. Of yeah. bias, yeah, because you're wondering, you know, are they, what are they posting mm -hmm. and will it go to whether or not they can be fair? Mm -hmm. So they asked about them. The first one was juror number one, so the first one. And they bring up some social media posts to the, to the judge. The judge wants to see them. They've screenshotted it. The mm -hmm. judge is looking at them, and he's really confused. He says, did you give me the right piece of paper? He didn't even understand what he was looking at. So there were some questions um, between that and that, he ended up wanting to see. They were videos. They were screenshots of videos. And one of the videos happened to be the, the juror, juror number one, um, had taken a video at a distance of what looked like a celebration in, in the streets of New York for, for when Trump lost in 2020. I think that was it. Mm -hmm. And it showed that she was biased, and there was some language that suggested that she, she might have a bias. Um, so she was called in and interviewed by the judge, and she said she happened to take the video when she was it was on the upper I think on the Upper West Side, and she was outside parking her car, and there was people celebrating in the distance. So she thought it was a very New York moment, and she mm -hmm. posted it. Mm -hmm. I also loved that it involved alternate, alternate side, side parking, parking in, yes. in yeah. New York. Yeah. It all it all it all comes down <laughs> to that in New York. So she so so she was interviewed and left the room, and then. We didn't have the cameras on, so we didn't have a visual of Donald Trump at this point from the overflow room that I sit in. We have closed circuit TVs, but the judge um, had there was some back and forth between the lawyers, and then the judge actually admonished the, admonished the former president because he was huffing and puffing and gesturing towards the the juror. It, he said it was the judge said it was completely inappropriate, and he said I won't tolerate it. I won't have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. Mm and his lawyer had to go speak to him. So that was like a moment. And, and the judge found in this case, in this juror, that this juror could continue. Hmm. Um, and they, you know, wasn't immediately pulled. But another juror had a social media post um, about the, tra you know, the travel ban, and it said, lock him up. So we, they went through one by one on these, and they had a lot of problematic posts, but they still, at the end of today, and it's still, I think, going on, but they so far had six jurors seated, which I thought was remarkable when I ran out of the courtroom around 3.30 to and get here. is Trump's legal team Googling the names of the potential jurors in real time from their phones? Are they offloading that work back to their law firms? Is it happening at the Trump campaign? Do, you, do we know so, where they're vetting potential so, jurors? So they were given the names of the jurors yesterday. They were told they couldn't make images of the names of the jurors. They couldn't copy them in any way, but they are allowed to have them. And I don't know if they have a jury consultant there. They, they might. That's typical. But they're doing this research kind of real time and finding the this stuff. But if they're Googling them, taking pictures of them, screenshotting them, and then handing them to I mean, they obviously have the names now. They can take the names home. Is that a concern? They can remember them. They can't take a list out of the courtroom, but they could remember them. It's definitely a concern. And I think the jurors, it's probably on their mind. Um, you'd like to think people act in good faith, but we've seen otherwise with this individual. And then the social media post, is that not a question on the, on the questionnaire? 
No, it, it's not. And, and, and it's interesting, often right? what you see in social media posts, there, there may be an explanation by it. The judge was satisfied by this woman's mm -hmm. explanation. One of them was, there was two and one of them was taken. It was a video taken quite far away. Um, and the judge, the judge was satisfied with it. And sometimes you may see somebody's got a bunch of social media posts and it happens to be a spoof account. So you have to ask mm -hmm. the jurors these sort of questions. Did you post it? Um, and then, and then, what's the context around it? But that's what we're going through now. But they came in, you know, I would say, loaded, loaded for bear when they came into the courtroom after lunch about this. Why didn't they use one of their, um, you know, strikes on her? They, I'm not I, actually. I'm not even sure if they if they did or not. Now that I'm thinking about huh. it, yeah, it kind of moved on. So they yeah, might have. They, they still, might have. They both both sides have some strikes left, mm -hmm. um, but that we're moving quite quickly. That we have six. There's speculation, and we don't know. You never know until you have a jury. That we could be done by Friday, but it's moving at a clip now. Yeah. But tomorrow morning we're going to go back into an, another hundred jurors and. He, the judge will spend half an hour reading them the preamble about the case and do you recognize any of these names that may be witnesses or may be brought up at trial and then they've got to go through you know they ask anybody if they want to leave and yeah. then they start the questionnaire so it's going to now slow roll again tomorrow until we get to another group of people that people seem fairly satisfied with and then you know, the, we'll but, have strikes. But, and, but to your point, that was the process yesterday. That got you six by day two. So, so in terms of pacing, it could be another six. And I think it's Thursday, right? Tomorrow they're done. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they it's, could it's get another tomorrow. six yeah. on Thursday Correct. and be done by Friday or Monday. That's faster than some people were, thought it might. Much faster. If it keeps this pace. Pace, yeah. But this is, I think everybody's saying this is already much faster than we thought. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.